Good afternoon. It's great to be back and uh, to see many old friends and hopefully make new friends. This is our 15th Expo, and we're looking forward to many more. Um, I think we're all familiar with the sad fact that we are losing uh, wild spaces and wildlife at an unprecedented rate. And most of the threats that are affecting wildlife arise from competition for resources between wild animals and the people that share the land with them. Unless we address that conflict and find ways in which those resources can be more wisely used, we are going to continue to lose those species, particularly those very rare ones. We have to find a way at, at, to trans, uh, transfer somehow resources from those of us that care about wildlife and have the means to help to those that live next to wildlife and uh, are at the receiving end of that conflict. So I'm convinced that we, together, with your help, we can help uh, those processes and support the changes that are required for uh, um, uh, finding uh, those solutions. In particular, I think we can help protect the Ethiopian wolves and the wonderful uh, uh, afro pine ecosystems where they live in Ethiopia uh, for the benefit of those that live next to the wolves and for the rest of the global community. The Ethiopian wolves represent by themselves a, a, a whole array of wildlife that lives in the highlands of Ethiopia, uh, high up above uh, uh, 10,000 feet. And this is the kind of habitat that I was expecting to experience when I first traveled to Africa. Uh, I trained as a biologist before conservation biology was conceived as a discipline. And I was looking for, and I'm sure many young people in our audience might be considering careers in conservation, well, I was looking forward to the excitement and, and the sexy activities that I could do, like myself as a young uh, graduate student in the 80s uh, studying Ethiopian wolves in the Valley Mountains of Ethiopia. Furthermore, as an Argentine gaucho, it was a great excuse for me to use my, my uh, horse riding skills to get to places. So why walk when you can ride? Um, and in this journey, I was joined by Jorgelina Marino, my, my wife in the mid-90s uh, that came uh, to Ethiopia and carried on her own studies on the ecology of the highlands of Ethiopia. The reality, however, and here is the warning for those aspiring conservationists, is that you're more likely to find yourself staring into a broken car like uh, my good friend here, Idris Ebu, who has been working with me for 30 years. Or even worse, once Idris' uh, mechanic skills run out, you know, get help and get your truck back to, to a garage. And this is increasingly a problem in conservation, those, having those vital resources to be able to do our work uh, efficiently. Go back to the horses. They won't let you down. And horses are the best way for us to get to the wolves, and furthermore, the best way of studying them would lead to disruption, because uh, they, they are used to people uh, uh, in the highlands that use horses for uh, their transport. Meet my good friend, uh, Alo Hussein. He's our senior wolf monitor, and he doesn't like the cold either, but he braves it out. And this is a typical uh, morning start in his endeavors uh, following wolves uh, in the highlands, and he knows them better than anyone else. But life is fun. We have great camps and we have a good time. Sometimes we are fortunate to have Sophie with us that cooks our dinner. And we find ourselves lost in these somehow dreamy, landscapes of the highlands of Ethiopia, where uh, more often than not, the weather closes in and it's very, far, very hard to find uh, our bearings. But these apparently barren lands are actually uh, teeming uh, with wildlife. But that wildlife is found underground. Um, because of the weather being so cold, uh, a strategy that pays is to have a, 
uh, uh, subterranean life and uh, benefit from those resources. And those uh, mounds you see uh, in the landscape actually are the result of activity of, uh, of rodents such as uh, the giant rats that are like, like marmots or pikes that been working generation after generation on those soils and increasing their productivity. And you could see in the foreground a wolf in what is prime Ethiopian wolf real estate in the Valley Mountains. Meet Tachyorictus macrocephalus, um, which is a wonderful uh, uh, species, but fortunate, it's also the favorite prey of the Ethiopian wolves. So they're always on the run, and you could notice those eyes that have migrated to the top of their heads, um, which is an a, a, a adapted way of being able to uh, you know, bring your head above the ground without exposing yourself too much. I like to think of Ethiopian wolves as, as, uh, as, uh, as uh, wolves in fox clothing because when you watch them uh, 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 stalking and catching the prey, uh, they adopt more, more uh, uh, fox-like and sometimes even cat-like uh, strategies. <laughs> A grass rat noticed that something is not quite right. But here I want to share with you a contrast between what is a solitary foraging strategy that these wolves have, that they're you know, they better off being by themselves with their, uh, uh, foraging for prey, because of prey being so small, uh, with a very intricate social life. Ethiopian wolves live in family packs, and sometimes those might be as, uh, as uh, large as 18 adults and as many as seven pups in a given year. And one wonders why living in groups if we are better off chasing our prey by, by ourselves? And the answer lies again on real estate and on those wonderful meadows I showed you earlier, because uh, larger groups can uh, chase away uh, smaller groups and can secure uh, home ranges, territories with patches of uh, abundant food that will see them through all year round. So larger packs uh, will do better than smaller packs, and these uh, tandem patrols of the, of the home ranges in the early morning and in the evening will help them using, uh, using uh, their uh, acute sense of smell to send mark and also to read the signpost of who has been there before and have a good understanding of what might be happening in, in the landscape and reacting accordingly. Uh, like other wolves, like other carnivores, uh, other canids rather, um, Ethiopian wolves, which happen to be uh, the rarest canid species in the world, with fewer than 500 animals surviving, and Africa most endangered uh, carnivore, uh, they breed once a year. And the dominant female of the pack will uh, have a, a, a litter of six, uh, even seven pups, um, which will uh, uh, bring up in a, in a barrel with the help of the rest of the pack. So we have a situation in which, although the mother bears the brunt of uh, raising the pups, sometimes with a little help from al an allosuckler female, which is another female that might produce uh, milk and suckle the, the dominant female pups, but also with great help from others. This is an auntie that came diligently to the den uh, uh, and brought food to the pups just now uh, at, a, uh, at an age where they are being weaned off milk and uh, starting on solids. And the, all, all these uh, baby sitters and, and cooperate breeders will uh, uh, catch food, bring it to the den and regurgitate it to the pups and help them in, in the rapid growth. You might wonder how come we have such an intimate knowledge of these animals and their behavior and ecology. And I was very fortunate to do my studies in, in this system. We clocked over 4,000 hours of observations of those animals uh, during my early research days. And that's thanks to these open sp spaces, the fact that the wolves are diurnal and they're fairly tolerant of our presence, and uh, that enables you 
to, to watch them from a distance. And in this case, uh, we continue doing this kind of observations as part of our monitoring that enable us to know how populations are doing and how uh, the, the reproduction is taking place and how many animals are recruited into the population. And looking into the I I far into the landscape is also a way of figuring out when your dinner is coming. Uh, we have here three hungry uh, uh, guys waiting for the next morsel of food. And you will see that there are also other people, young people in this case, that will use vantage points to uh, look out. In this case, there's uh, young shepherds that will be uh, keeping an eye on their, uh, uh, on their uh, herds. And that remind us that you are never very far away from people in the highlands of Ethiopia, a country with 100 million people. And indeed, even inside the protected areas where we work, uh, there are small villages and settlements which uh, um, uh, emphasize that uh, coexistence or that competition, if you wish, between people and wildlife and the needs of people and the needs of wildlife. And that is at the center of the challenges we are trying to address. And this is not just for us, but you would have heard this in many other presentations, um, how we address that and we provide some benefits for the local communities while taking care of wildlife. And with people um, comes uh, livestock and they come domestic dogs. And in this case, dogs are particularly relevant because they uh, transmit uh, canine diseases to the wild relatives, and rabies and canine distemper have been the most immediate and present threat to Ethiopian wolves in the last 30 years. And sometimes when rabies strike, we might lose as many as three quarters of the affected population. So the obvious approach to try to protect our wolves from, from rabies infection uh, was uh, to consider a One Health approach. And by One Health, we mean ways in which we, by vaccinating domestic dogs, we are deriving benefits for the dogs themselves, but also for the people that own the dogs. Uh, rabies is a deadly disease. If you uh, get bitten by a dog and you're not treated, you will die in a nasty way. And you will also be protecting wildlife. So it's a win-win situation. And we've been vaccinating thousands of dogs with, the help, with your help uh, all these years to try to prevent uh, uh, rabies to, to uh, hit to the wolves. But unfortunately, uh, with so many dogs, coming into the mountains, and with the high turnover, with people getting new puppies and bringing them in, it's very difficult to sustain that threshold of about 70% of the uh, uh, of vaccination of that uh, dog population to stop disease in the landscape. So occasionally, the wolves get sick, we get permission from government, we intervene, and we are able to capture and vaccine the wolves themselves. Only two years ago, at when the last rabies uh, um, outbreak struck in the Valley Mountains, we were able to step in and vaccinate 100 wolves. And that is about a quarter of the global population of this rare species. Only a few months ago, um, in one of the most remote uh, uh, areas where wolves are present in northern Ethiopia, uh, the, the Lanta Range, we started having reports from our wolf monitors who are uh, local uh, members, uh, members of the local community that work for the project, that some animals were dying. We went in, we found some dead animals, we got those samples uh, out, we tested and we confirmed for the first time in this particular population that rabies uh, was at work. And we're talking about a tiny enclave with only 20, 25 wolves. Six of those had died. Uh, by, by the time we confirmed rabies. And then we uh, got permission from government to intervene. Our teams went in, and we looked and looked, and we were able to capture two animals, and those two were vaccinated. So as of today, we think that there are only three to five animals left in that landscape. And that's a very, very uh, sad uh, news for us, because that basically means a, a, a functional extinction. It's very difficult that we will be able to recover that population to levels. And that's basically 
uh, because we're talking about tiny little places uh, that where this uh, habitat remain. And this is as a result of that pressure from uh, the communities uh, farming and, and, and raising livestock around the mountains and pushing ever high uh, the mountains. So obviously, the solutions we have to find to uh, secure this, uh, this land, both for the wolves, but also for the future generations of Ethiopians living there, is to try to provide uh, for these small, these small ranges. And um, we wouldn't have known about these areas uh, without the work we started when Jorgelina uh, joined the project in the mid-90s, and we were able, after the Civil War had ended, to visit areas that had been uh, precluded for, uh, for us uh, uh, previously. So I want to pass you on to Jorgelina that will tell you the rest of the story. Thank you. Yeah, it was like uh, 15 years ago when with Claudio and our Ethiopian colleagues we visited the Lanta, that is small population, and that's a population I fell in love with because it's very small and it was like a small wolf paradise. So that's why it's so concerning that these small populations are having rabies uh, at this time. And uh, during that time we spent two years visiting all the high mountains of Ethiopia. And it was a great time for me as a young conservationist because it was a time of uh, discovery and adventure. And that is what had motivated me to be a biologist in the first place. So we visited all these mountains and in the process I realized that uh, the highlands of Ethiopia are vast and green and beautiful which is not the, the idea that most of us has when we think of Ethiopia, because of the famine and the poverty. But I was living in, a, in Argentina, in the Andes, in the Patagonian Andes, and I also discovered that when you go to the mountains, all the mountains seem to be alike. As soon as you go up and up, you have the grasslands and the open places. But on the other hand, the mountains of Ethiopia are special. They have unique species, but also the people are unique and the cultures are unique. For example, the Amharic people, the people from Amara, they have their own calendar, their own alphabet, and they have 13 months a year. And believe it or not, today is the 24th of the first month of 2009 in Ethiopia. So it was a great discovery for me. And uh, these fantastic highlands, uh, have many, many people living there. Claudio mentioned there are 100 million people living in Ethiopia, and 80% of those are living in the highlands, and these are the people that are sharing their land with the wolves. So I got to know the people sharing the land, living next to the wolves as well, as I uh, spend more time in Ethiopia. So uh, a normal family will have a small plot of land, where they cultivate barley, and they will have a small herd of goats, maybe an ox and, and some donkeys. And they take the animals to graze up in the highlands every day in the morning and back in the afternoon. And they need the highlands also for the firewood. Mostly women will be going up and collecting this type of bush, for example, that is called charanfe. So they need the firewood for the heating, for the cooking, and for the lighting. So there is a lot of pressure, as you can imagine, on the same resources on which the, the wolves depend on. And so protecting the mountains is as important as protecting the wolves. And that's not only important for the people living next to the wolves. These mountains are the sources of water for millions of people down the mountains in Ethiopia and even abroad. So protecting the mountains is protecting very special sources of water. I put this picture because this is a lovely swamp. It's up at 4,000 meters in Mount Choke. It's at the heart of the Blue Nile uh, Basin. And it looks fantastic, but most of the swamps now are overgrazed. And the vegetation that keeps like a sponge, keeps the water and take, release it slowly, are dying. So how important it is these mountains, the wolves, and the people. 
So after all that traveling, I, we come up with this map. In this map, we show little islands of Afro-Alpine in black, in a sea of people and farlam. So there are six Ethiopian wolf population now. They are all isolated from each other. And as you can understand, all of them are very important. S the news for us were sad and good. On one hand, a population with 40 wolves or 20 wolves will easily go extinct. On the other hand, it's better to have several populations rather than just one. You don't want to carry all your eggs in one basket. So at that time, when I finished my PhD and I wanted to continue working in Ethiopia, I said, okay, well, we have a lot of people working in the Bale Mountains. That is the core population. Still, it's only 300 wolves. So we started working up in the north as well, in all those tiny uh, spots shown there in the map. So what kind of things we do? I mean, the first thing, we start uh, working with children, working in education, the Ethiopian wolf is a magnificent flagship for the conservation of the Afro-Alpine. Ethiopians really are very proud of having this wolf, among other unique animals and plants that they have. But you know, not all the children are lucky. Not all of them go to school, so they are children as young as some of you here in the audience. They are shepherds. They are the ones that go with the goats every day to the mountain. So we are also talking with them, working with them, Sometimes the children chase the wolves. You know, the wolves, as you know well, they eat rats. They don't really, they prefer to eat rats, if they can. They will rarely kill livestock. Sometimes the children chase them away, and, and Ethiopian wolves need a lot of time to forage. They need time and space to catch rodents. So sometimes little things like that can help animals to be strong and to breed well and to have a healthy population. And then there was the challenge of being present in all these little populations, which is really a challenge. Some of them are very remote. And initially, we, our team was composed mostly of, by two people. Uh, our education officer, Feka Dulema, which we know from the very beginning, and younger chap, Gebe Yoroske, he's the monitoring officer. He was coming to the, all these populations, trying to keep an eye on the wolves. So eventually we decided to start working with our wolf ambassadors. I, this, in, in this photo we see Shimeles there on your right. He's the wolf ambassador from the Borena National Park, one of, the, one of those isolated mountains in my map. So they are our eyes and our ears, and they, of course, are the people that help us to be in touch also with the communities, with the schools. And for example, they were the ones that reported that wolves were dying in the Lanta. It would have been very easy to miss it, and that population maybe would have been lost by now. And then we are being creative, and like all our, you know, probably you heard about all our projects, we need to find ways for that people to be able to still live in the same place with the wildlife and, and survive. So we are trying uh, different things. For example, we are promoting the production of honey, uh, which you know, comes from traditionally people have been doing there. So they will be protecting the Erika forest and the Erika moorlands that are part of the ecosystem. And another initiative which I really like is the production of fuel saving stoves. These are the stoves that take around half of the firewood that is required normally for cooking, and also it's healthier for the women that are always in their round tokuls cooking and you know, in contact with that smoke. So we are doing that. We have now five local entrepreneurs producing these stoves, and we are marketing. We are showing them in the local market how they work. And we are starting subsidizing the first one to kick you know, these new entrepreneurs in their business. But still, the loss of the habitat remains the main problem. You know, all these people in the highlands, they need land. So there are new protected areas in Ethiopia, two new wolf populations are now within new or extended protected areas, but they don't have necessarily the funds or the expertise. 
So we are really, really enthusiastic about our work. We are starting to work with these two new protected areas in different ways. So, you know, there are many things that need to be done, and sometimes, you know, people say, why to protect those small populations? Are they doomed? We don't think they are. And the wolves are there. They are dogs. They are flexible. You know, they will. They will hang on. So, you know, your help, uh, many people in w uh, that came to WCN has helped us a lot, and we continue. We continue needing your support. Uh, Ethiopia is a poor country, and Ethiopia won't be the same without the Ethiopian wolves. So thank you, and I pass on to Claudio uh, to you. wrap it up. Let's stay here. We can all help, and by transferring somehow resources from those of us that care and have the ability to give to those ones that are greater, in greatest need that live hand in hand with wildlife. We can improve the situation of the guardians of the roof of Africa, as we like to call these wonderful animals. And in doing so, and in order to do so, we're also providing some hope for these people living on the poverty edge, or living on the edge of the world, if you wish. Um, so we're confident that through hard work and dedication, we can provide a future for the wolves, and we can secure sustainable lives for those sharing the land with them. So uh, we'll be happy to, to take more questions now and perhaps talk to some of you uh, later in our booth and see ways in which uh, you could help us help them. Thank you. <laughs>